sing glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Put our hands together. Let's make a joyful sound. Before the world was made, before you spoke it to me, you were the king of kings. Yeah, you were, yeah, you were. And now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out. We join them as we see. the 
skies with endless praise, endless praise.
there's no one like our God one last time. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing. Let's rejoice together as brothers that our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah, and the Lamb that was slain on our behalf. Amen. Let's sing about that. Cause our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power, and He's fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Cause our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion in the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. And every chain will break His broken hearts declare His praise Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Cause our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah He's roaring with power And He's fighting our battles and every knee will bow Yeah, I don't 
So, our new subject. <clears throat> I'm excited about this, the church. We're going to spend all year just studying about the church. I think there's a lot of confusion in our day and age about the church and what it really is and what God's intention is with the church. What is it? What's its purpose? Who builds it? Who owns it? Is it essential? You know, we have... We have a lot of people in leadership in this country that think strip joints and bar rooms are more essential than church is. And uh, of course we have some godly men around the country in different states that are battling those, those leaders uh, to keep their churches open and we need to keep those men in prayer. There's a lot of people that take an attitude towards the church. By the way, head to 1 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> A lot of people take the attitude toward the church. I don't really need it. I am fine on my own. Well, let's take a look at what Paul says. Paul is obviously teaching and training his young man, Timothy. And he gets to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> In verses 1 through 7, he gives the qualifications for bishops and pastors. 8 through 13, he gives the qualifications for deacons. And then verse 14, he says this very interesting statement. He said, these things I write to you, though I hope to be come to you shortly, but if I'm delayed, I write so that you might know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Let's just stop there for a minute. We'll pick up verse 16 in a few minutes. Let's, let's take a look at those words. The word, he says, uses the word house of God. The word there is oikos, a place of assembly, a meeting, a place of meeting, a place that may have roof and walls, and air conditioning in many places in the world, they don't have that privilege and they meet outside because they're, they're uh, hiding from the authorities. We're very blessed in this country. This tin box that we, could, that we meet in, this is the oikos, okay? It's the meeting place. The next word is the church, the church of the living God. It's ecclesia. It's those who are called out of darkness into the light. Those who belong to God. 1 Peter 2.9 gives us a very good description. But you are the chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You and I are the church. We're the ecclesia. We don't come to the church. We are the church. And we bring ourselves, we bring the ecclesia into the house, into the oikos, so to speak. Look at the next word, pillar. It says we are the pillar. Pillar and ground. The pillar is stylos. It's, the col it's like a column, a, a, a support, a prop, a support. Like great buildings, the Supreme Court building has great pillars in front of it. Many government buildings, they, they emphasize that power, that place of power by the way they design and build they, with these large pillars. Uh, it's also like, like a large signpost that lifts a message and displays a message for people to see. Back a number of years ago down here on Wade Hampton, there used to be a huge big billboard sign there. It had beautiful scenery of a, uh, outdoor scenery with a moose walking across the snow. And the caption said, we love all animals right next to the mashed potatoes. It was, it was a restaurant and they're about, uh, about the kind of food that they served. And, and it, really, it really caught people's eye. It really got that message out. Some of my vegetarian friends didn't care a whole lot for it, but it, it got the job done. 
That's what we are. We're a, we're a signpost. And we display an image. He's going to tell us here the truth. It says we're the ground, the pillar and ground. Hadrioma, I believe it's pronounced it that way. It's not dirt. It's not the dirt that you shovel. It's the base. Okay, every tall pillar needs to have a strong and wide base to, to support it as, as, it's, as it's lifted and lifting its message in the air. So we're the pillar and the ground and we're the foundation that gives that signpost support. Truth, Ialatha is the word, with respect to God and his purposes through Christ towards man, not your truth, it's not my truth, it's the truth of God that he's talking about here. Romans 3, 4 says, let, it, let God be true and every man a liar. It's God's truth. Now, this summer, as we go through all these messages on the church, we're going to find and we're going to look at many truths that, that the church is responsible for and that we, we hold up as, a, as believers. But there's one defining truth that all other truths grow out of, and that's where we just stopped at verse 16. It says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. How is a sinful man reconciled with a holy God? That is, that is a great mystery. God was manifest in the flesh. That's the incarnation. He was justified in the spirit. We see the spirit present at his baptism. He was seen by angels. They were there in the, when he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted. He's preached among the Gentiles. Paul certainly uh, understood that. Believed on in the world. Remember it in Acts we see that many were added and then many were multiplied. As, as the gospel was preached and shared with them, he was received up into glory. That's the resurrection. Paul here describes the great truth to be displayed by the truth. It's the person and work of Jesus Christ. The first time we see this is in Matthew 16, 16. It's when Jesus asked him, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, you got that from God. You didn't get that from man. And in verse 18, he says, Peter, he calls him Petros. He says, you, you are, you're going to be a rock. Remember when, when he said, told uh, Peter, when you're restored to, 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 to lead your, your fellow apostles, Peter, you're going to be Petros, a rock to the church, but on this rock, Petra, two different words. Peter is Petros, the, the rock that we're talking about now is Petra, a huge rock like the rock of Gibraltar. I will build my church on his person and his work, the fact that he is Christ, the son of the living God, and he says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Listen, guys, this is his church. It's not your church. It's not my church. It's not the pastor's church. It's not the elder's church. This is Christ's church. He is the head of this church. No man, no king, no queen is the head of the church. The early reformers prayed, paid dearly for that doctrine. They call it solos Christos, meaning Christ alone is the head of the church. The Bible tells us that the Lord builds three things. Now, of course, he's not so much into nation building. He allows them to be built up and he tears them down and he, he rearranges and takes people out of power and allows people into power. But the mainly, mainly the things that God is concerned about building, he says in Psalm 147.2, that he builds Jerusalem. Jerusalem is his city. We, we tend to, we call Rome the eternal city. Now, it's going to be Jerusalem. Jerusalem's where he's going to, and, and that's not even going to be eternal, but that's where he's going to rule from. He says in the Old Testament, Jerusalem is mine. Don't mess with it. It's my city. <clears throat> and 
And the other thing he builds is a celestial city where we're going to, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And the third thing he builds is his church. He builds it on a foundation of his person and his work, that work of redeeming mankind through his death and the shedding of his blood. Now, what does this all mean to us? What we're talking about here is, is coming together, assembly. And we find that throughout the, the Bible, all through the Old Testament, all through the New Testament, his people assemble. Psalm, uh, I'm sorry, I already gave you Psalm 40, didn't I? When, when God has a message that he wants to give to his people, he assembles his people and he gives that message through a leader. Over and over and over again, we see that. We see uh, Moses in the Old Testament. He would assemble the people. Uh, we, we see it uh, with uh, Solomon. He, he assembled the people when he wanted to have the celebration over the, the completion of the temple. David assembled the people when he was going to... Uh, celebrate bringing the, the, the Ark of the Covenant back to Israel. We see it in the New Testament. Uh, John the Baptist assembled the people and prepared the way for Christ to come. Christ assembled the people on the mount when he, when he gave the, the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Over and over and over again, we see this concept of, of God's people being assembled for the purpose of receiving something from God. Job 30, 28, the oldest book in the Bible. Job says, I stand in the assembly and cry out for help. Job understood the assembling of, of God's people. In Nehemiah, when the, when the captives returned from uh, the captivity, Ezra, the priest, Nehemiah 8, 2, he brought the law and, be, and uh, the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding and uh, on the first day of the of the seventh month. That was at the end of their seventy five year captivity, being probably immersed with pagan teaching and pagan things around them. The first thing that Ezra does is bring them together and teach them the word. Josiah, when they found the neglected book of the law, 2 Kings 2, 3, he gathered, assembled the people, the priests, the prophets, and all the people, and read all the words of the book of the covenant. They all took a stand for the Lord. Again, we talked about David, about Solomon, about Elijah. He assembled the people when he did battle with the prophets of the Baal, Baal so that they could see the results of that battle. The apostles assembled the people on the day of Pentecost when the church began. Jesus stood up in the assembly at Nazareth and read Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, when he launched his ministry. Paul would go to the, the synagogue and first stand up there in the assembly and, and preach the gospel. The church assembles on the first day in honor of the resurrection. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Let, and let us consider one another in order to stir up good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. There is just no place in God's economy for lone sheep. The wolf wants you alone and defenseless. We, we come together, that verse in Hebrews says, to stir up love and good works. The church, you and I, the ecclesia, we hold up the truth of God to a lost and dying world. We display Jesus as he destroys the works of the devil, 1 John 3, 8. The church, you and I, the ecclesia, we assemble to be in a place where we are stirred up to love and to good works. 
We're, we're encouraged to stir up the gifts that are given to us by God. We're encouraged and taught to do the work of the ministry. Acts 6, 7 says, Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Listen, guys, you and I can't do that. We can't accomplish that kind of stuff on our own. Just being a freelancer and not being part of this local assembly. Listen, I can tell you in 43 years of being a believer, and I've known a lot of Christians in 43 years, I can't give you the name of one, not one person who was a, a lone sheep who just was out there doing his own thing, not having anything to do with the, with the local church and with his fellow believers in the local church. I can't tell you one person in 43 years I know that was successful. I've known some that have tried it. I, I just recently came across the guy who shared with me that God had just recently showed him the exact right translation, the only one that God will, will use. And he even offered to come and share that with my pastor and teach my pastor how he could use that one and only true translation. I spared you from that PR. There's, a, there's some lone, lone sheep out there, but they're not producing what God would have them produce. There's a lot who grew up in the church and take liber, liberty, thinking that they can improve on God's plans. Let's just think about some of the excuses we've heard over the years. There's that famous old one, there's too many hypocrites in the church. Hey, I don't want to be around those people. There are too many hypocrites. Well, you know, our answer is, we'll come and join up. We can always use one more. <laughs> I've been hurt in that church, and I'm not going back. I have a friend who was hurt in that church. I'm not going back to church anymore. Have you ever been, anybody ever been hurt at home by one of your relatives? Anybody been hurt at work? Anybody been hurt out any place in the world? What do you do? Do you drop out of your family? Do you have nothing to do with your family? Do you drop out of work and don't work? Do, do you become a hermit and, and live out in the wilderness with nobody around you? I, I don't think so. I don't think that's a good plan. How many times have you heard this one? Look at all the wars and, and the death that the church has caused over the years. I don't want anything to do with that. You know, I'm still amazed that people who, you know, are modern day and have the, have the uh, information available to them that we do today, that people still latch on to that. That kind of business that they're trying to refer to, like the Crusades, that wasn't the church. That was a group of powerful political people trying to get political power. That wasn't the church. There is no mandate for the church to mount up an army and go back and take back Jerusalem. God's going to get control of Jerusalem when he's ready. There is no mandate for the church to war against two factions in the church for a hundred years like they did in Europe. That stuff was not the church. It was not the mandate of the church. I'm not saying that some believers didn't get caught up in it, but that was not a mandate of the church. That was powerful political people using the name of Christ and the name of the church to try and gain or hang on to power. Same thing we see in government today, over and over and over again. Uh, another excuse is that leader failed me. That leader fell into sin, and, and I'm disappointed, and I'm not going to have anything to do with church anymore. Now listen, uh, right now, all over the internet, uh, there's, there's uh, information about a man who was a, a man of God for many years. I'm not going to use his name because I don't know the, all the truth and all the details yet, but it does look like there was great moral failure in his life, and he's not with us anymore. What, what does that do when that happens? What does that do to your faith? What does that do to your commitment to the local church when somebody in a powerful position, in a position of influence, it's revealed that they, they had a great moral failure in their life? You know, the answer to that question is it should do absolutely nothing. Our, our devotion is strictly to Christ and to his believers. 
What was the two most important commandments? To love the Lord your God and you love others as yourself. That's where our commitment should be. Our commitment is not to any man or woman, any leader. It doesn't negate, when someone falls into sin like it, it doesn't negate the truth that they've taught for many years. One, one well-known uh, teacher said, said it like this, God has many times used a crooked, strict, a crooked stick to draw a straight line. And, and we, we, need to, we need to hold fast to our faith and not let things like that uh, swerve us and, and get us discouraged and not want go to go back to church. Our dedication is to Christ and to, his, and to our fellow believers. The church, the ecclesia, we assemble to learn and to grow in the truths of God so we can assimilate them to other growing believers and to the lost. We meet for fellowship, breaking of bread, prayers, and the worship of the one true God. Ephesians 3, verse 9 through 11. Paul's talking about preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. He says, to make all see what is the fellowship or stewardship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Christ Jesus to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. Now get a load of this. By us, the church, the ecclesia. The manifold wisdom of God is going to be made known to the principalities and powers in heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Fellas, that's the same principalities and powers that we fight against. Ephesians uh, 6.12 says we don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against principalities and powers. And here it says one of our purposes as a church is display the manifold wisdom of God to those principalities, those individuals, those created beings that operate in heavenly places far above where we live. Ephesians 2, 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Do you really think that you can accomplish any of these things if you neglect the design of God? The church is God's plan. It's its design. And we're going to look at a lot of, a lot of stuff this summer about the way the church operates and our responsibilities towards the church, towards God and the church. And we, we just cannot accomplish the things that I just mentioned there in those few verses by living outside of God's plan and outside of God's design. A few, uh, maybe two months ago before the holidays, Kathy and I got to uh, spend a little time with a, with a couple that we have known for 40 years. 40 years ago, we met them at, uh, in the community where we lived and we had just gotten saved. We invited them to church. They got saved. Their kids were our age, our kids' age. And we just became friends. And over the years, most of our 40 years, we, didn't, we weren't able to spend a lot of time together. We lived in different states. Jobs took us different directions. But still, every time we get together, it's just like we pick up right where we left off. And this was such a blessing to spend some time with these folks. We hadn't seen them in a long time. And to see that still today, their commitment to the local church is as strong as ever. Their kids are all grown. They've got grandkids. They're in church every Sunday. They use their gifts that God has given them to, to enrich and, and help other believers to grow in Christ. It was just a great blessing to see that in their lives. I think of one more example. Daniel. What a powerful example Daniel was. Now he lived before the church as we know it today. But again, he, he knew what it was he knew what it was all about to assemble with God's people. And I'm sure even in captivity 
he got together with his fellow believers whenever he had an opportunity to. But you know, I can't quite picture Daniel saying, I'm packing my stuff up and I'm hiking back to back home. I'm, this, this king is not my king. I'm not serving this guy. Daniel never took it. Daniel evangelized uh, Nebuchadnezzar, didn't he? And he was actually successful in winning Nebuchadnezzar to, 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 the, to Yahweh, the God of the Jews. And how did he do that? He held up the truth to Nebuchadnezzar every chance he got over and over and over again. He held up the truth until eventually Nebuchadnezzar could not do anything but acknowledge the truth. Listen, guys, that's our calling. Our calling is to be that signpost, to be that, to be that pillar and ground of the truth, the Lord Jesus Christ and his person and his work. And there's a lot of things that grow out of that, but that is the basis. That's where we're starting our study with the church. I like what Brian always says, let's go out and make Jesus look good. We're, we're, the, we're the pillar. We're the ground. We're the signpost that holds up the Lord Jesus Christ and his truth and what he's planning to do, what he's already done. It's changed my life, it's changed your life, and our prayer is it's going to change a lot of lives of people that you're all connected with. So, oh, I feel like I could just go on for a while yet, but we got to, time-wise, we got to put a caboose on this train and go to small groups, all right? Thanks for coming. Uh, I have a, I have a message from, okay, okay, Bob's virtual small group uh, will join up with Rick's small group link on the flock note. So Bob is homesick. Have we heard how he's doing? Is he doing better? Pardon? Starting to turn the corner. Okay, so if you were in Bob's small group, uh, you're going to uh, hook up with Rick's small group on Flocknote. Um, if, if you need to send an email to PR, go ahead and do that. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your church. Man, what a blessing that you have designed this organism for us to be a part of and, and a place where we can grow and we can learn how to serve you. Help us to never take that for granted and to, to, um, to neglect what you've designed for us. And Lord, we, just, we thank you for what you're doing. Bless our time in the small groups as we discuss these truths. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.